The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. These approached Philip, who came from Bethsaida in Galilee, and put this request to him, Sir, we should like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip together went to tell Jesus. Jesus replied to them, now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you most solemnly, unless a wheat grain falls on the ground and dies, it remains only a single grain. But if it dies, it yields a rich harvest. Anyone who loves his life loses it. Anyone who loves Anyone who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If a man sells me, he must follow me. Wherever I am, my servant will be there too. If anyone sells me, my father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but it was for this very reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. People standing by who heard this said it was a clap of tender. Others said it was an angel speaking to him. Jesus answered, It was not for my sake that this voice came, but for yours. Now, sentence is being passed on this world. Now, the prince of this world is to be overthrown. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I shall draw all men to myself. By these words, he indicated the kind of death he will die. The Gospel of the Lord. Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great foot thy faithfulness. Amen. Amen. Beloved in Christ, today is the fifth Sunday in Lent. And we are fortunate to be here in the presence of the Lord. We know that every relationship of God with man is based on the a covenant. God has related to us on the basis of covenant. He related with Adam on the basis of covenant. God related with Noah on the basis of covenant, related with Moses on the basis of covenant, and related with David on the basis of covenant. And God relates with us in a new dispensation also on the basis of covenant. And covenant is the agreement or transaction 
that God has entered into with mankind, which determines and influences the acts of God towards his people. And the kind of covenant we make with God determines the kind of treatment we will receive from him. So we are not going to have God's blessing, God's grace, and eternal life out of vacuum. Jesus promises eternal happiness and joy forever with God on the basis of God's covenant with us. Beloved in Christ, Jeremiah foretold the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem if his people didn't stop sinning. But in the end, because people didn't listen, Judah was taken to exile in Babylon. In today's first reading, the prophet Jeremiah was uh, sent to the exile to offer them a, a message of hope and the message of restoration. A message to the frustrated and dejected Jews in the exile or in servitude in Babylon. A message that will lift them up, that will lift their spirit. A message of hope to the hopeless Jews to make them feel better about themselves. And this is what we need when we reach the end of our strength, when we feel rejected and we feel rejected, and when we feel that there is no hope for us. When we go through the most challenging moment in our life, there was this man of God who lost his entire family through car accident, he lost his children, and he lost his wife. In moments like this, beloved in Christ, we need words of encouragement to re-energize us, to move ahead in our life. And this was exactly what Jeremiah did. No matter your loss and no matter the pain, God has something big in store for you, he told the Jewish slaves, in Babylon. The comforting message, dear friends in Christ, was that God was about to make a new covenant with the troubled Jews in Babylon, and this new agreement will open the way to God's mercy and the way to God's grace to the people of Israel. So God was going to deal with them on the his mercy and on his loving kindness. So no more on the basis of the law, which was difficult for them to keep or obey. And this new covenant will last forever, and it will not be inscribed on a stone tablet. It will be inscribed in their heart. A new heart will be created in people, and a new spirit will be given to them. So God will move all hearts by his grace so that they will keep the covenant. So in those days, people will not be persuaded to worship God. People will not be persuaded to come to church. They will know the need to come and worship God because the spirit of God will be implanted in their Heart. We will not even bother to serve for the lost believers. Everybody will have the spirit of God dwelling in him or her. So this new era is here with us, beloved in Christ. The new covenant has been entered already through the victory of the cross. Jesus, by atonement for our sins, has established this new covenant. We are covenant people. And God is our father. So we no longer operate under the law. We operate under grace, under the grace of God. And some people, beloved in Christ, believe that when they come to church, they are doing the pastor a favor. They are operating under the law. 
which is past and gone, you are doing yourself good. You are working for your salvation. So if you don't feel like coming to church to worship God, well, it is true to stay away. And people come to worship when they feel like coming. So under the new covenant, people are still operating as if worship of God is a burden. Even under the new dispensation, where the Spirit has been given to us in a full measure, people operate under the law. And because the pastor told me to come, that's why I'm here. Even the stations of the cross is still a burden to Catholics. So if you are forced to worship, if you are forced to come to church, there is no way you will receive blessing, forget it. You must operate under the new spirit. And Jeremiah said, everything will be written in their heart. There will be no further need for a brother to tell a brother, learn to know God. There's no need for a brother to tell a brother, come to, go, come to church. There's no need for a brother to tell a brother, come and worship, come to a station of a cross, because the spirit is there in their heart. And no one will tell the other, love and worship and pray to the Lord. They will know me because I inscribed my law within their heart. So maybe like David, we need to pray for a pure heart, a pure heart in God. So beloved in Christ, Jesus goes on to say in the gospel that it is true his suffering, it is true his torturing, it is true his crucifixion, and it is true his death that the new covenant will be established. It is through his suffering and death that this new covenant will be established. And there is no shining diamond without the force of friction making it shine. And you cannot claim to be a victor when you have not gone to a battle. And so you can't say you are victorious when you have never been to battle. You go to battle before you can become Victorious. So if there is a victory to be won, surely there is a battle to fight. Without that suffering, there will be no glory for Jesus. So this time in Jesus' life, the opposition is growing very, very strong. The Pharisees and the elders, the Sahindrin, were trying to eliminate and destroy Jesus. And many people came, came to believe in Jesus and when he raised up Lazarus from the dead. And it was a Passover feast. Uh, many visitors came to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival. And as Jesus enters Jerusalem, everybody is praising and hailing him and calling him all kinds of titles. You are blessed, you are the Messiah, the King of Kings, the King of Israel. And this actually intensified the hatred for him by the chief priests and the elders because everybody was singing his praises. Children, women, men, everybody singing his praises. So the Pharisees got mad. Everybody is following Jesus. So jealous they became. So as Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, uh, two people came to see him. Uh, these uh, were Greeks who came to Jerusalem for the week-long celebration of the Passover. And they didn't go to Jesus directly. Uh, they passed through Philip and Andrew. And we don't know the reason for seeking Jesus. But Jesus used that occasion to teach them about his impending death and resurrection. So Jesus' opening words were, The hour had come. The hour had come. Now remember when Mary asked Jesus um, during the beginning, it would be from the beginning of his ministry, as Jesus to help the wedding at Cana, Jesus said his hour had not come. His hour had not come. 
And later in chapter 4 of John's Gospel, verse 21, he said, An hour is coming. Now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be lifted up, to be glorified. So what kind of hour Jesus had in mind? And what kind of hour had he in mind? It was the hour of his death. The hour of his death. It was hour of self-giving in which he made a complete sacrifice of himself for us. In fact, from worldly point of view, that hour was an hour of failure. It was an hour of shame, hour of humiliation, and hour of defeat. But by raising him from the dead, God turned it into an hour of triumph and an hour of grace. So may God turn our shame into fame, and may God turn our defeat into victory, and may God turn our sorrow into joy. May God turn our poverty into riches. Amen? Amen. This was the hour when all that he had come to do on earth was accomplished. Beloved in Christ, the darkest and most painful hour in the life of a seed is the hour in which it dies. The darkest and painful hour in the life of a seed of corn or master seed is the hour in which it dies. Yet this is precisely the hour in which new life is born. When it's dying, is growing. It is the same with us today in our life. Our lowest moment can prove to be the turning point. Our darkest moment can be a great change and a great growth for us. And looking back on our life, we will see that the incidents which seem to be great failures were incidents which shaped the lives we have now. The things that hurt us and the things that help us cannot be separated from each other. And there is tears in sowing, but there is hope that after the years of struggle will come harvest. And Jesus says again, are you ready? If you are ready to follow me, do what I did. If you are ready to be with me, if you are ready to be part of me, do what I did. I sacrificed for you. I died for you. You two prepare to die, prepare to sacrifice for me. Hate your life. Die to serve. If you want to share my glory, be ready to go through what I went through. Wow. This is difficult, isn't it? Beloved in Christ, dying to serve means the things of the old life are put to death. Dying to serve means the things of our own life are put to death. Most especially the sinful ways and lifestyle we once engage in. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful ways, the sinful nature with its passion and desires. Where we once pursue selfish pleasures, we now pursue that which pleases God. And no one can come to Christ unless he is willing to see his own life crucified with him. And that what is what it means to die to self and begin anew. And Christ says, I don't want lukewarm Christians, lukewarm Christians. I want a total commitment. Lukewarm Christians, 
are unwilling to die to serve and live for me. Death to serve is a choice that leads us to eternal life. Beloved in Christ, are we ready to put, death, to, put to death all our evil intentions, all our sinful behaviors? Are we ready to put to death our pride and our arrogance? We see there is something about pride and arrogance. You see, nobody can advise you. Are you ready to crucify that to the cross? Are we ready to put to death the wrong perception we have about people? Are we ready to crucify all our sinful ways? And are we ready to crucify our unfaithfulness so that we can live, so that we can have a new life in Christ? Are we ready to crucify our sensual desires that trouble us in our life? And Jesus says, if you are ready to die to serve, to crucify that, to put to death, we will have a new strength and a new life in him. So this morning, on the fifth Sunday of Lent year B, ask yourself, I'm also asking myself this question, what do I need to die of? What do I need to die to in my life? What do I need? This is our meditation for today when we go home. Let's meditate on that. What do I need to die to in my life? This morning, may the good Lord continue to fill us with his strength, with his spirit, and give us a new heart to die to serve, to walk in the new way of Christ. Amen.